Honeywell. Uh, we're going to talk some quantum updates, but before I dive into the quantum, uh, Daniel, uh, didn't Honeywell uh, win some big uh, award uh, out there? Yeah, so I guess all is well at Honeywell. And you and I have had the benefit of being on the, <laughs> so you know, the analyst council um, working around the quantum business. But over yeah. time, we've, we've had the opportunity to become a little bit more familiar with the broader Honeywell. And this is a company at Impasse. Um, very successful, large company, but tends to be more well understood as an industrial company. Now, this is a company that does engineering that impacts jet engines. This is a company that builds healthcare equipment that saves lives. And this is also a company that builds N95 masks in scale um, and, and you know a lot of other um, more what I call commoditized type of, of things. So people don't really know what to make of it, which is kind of funny, Pat, by the way, because we figured out with Amazon that it's a tech company, even though it sells everything on the planet. But for some reason with a Honeywell, it's been a little harder to sort of get the analyst community and the global um, you know, investment community to say, hey, this is a, a tech company. And part of that probably also comes down to the speed of growth, right? Amazon yeah. growth is exponential. Honeywell's has been more of a stair step. It's good, but it's not mind blowing. Okay, sideshow to the whole ordeal, but worth noting because yeah. it really sets up what happened here. You know, the company, um, Fast Company, which is, you know, a pub that I really do respect, um, tends to be very high on journalistic integrity, doesn't have, you know, a ton of uh, low quality inputs, spends a lot of time when it does pump out things like this particular report, which was world's most innovative company. And among enterprise uh, enterprises that it ranked, um, Honeywell came in in the top five most innovative enterprises on the planet. And this is from over 463 companies, 29 different countries. Um, and so it, it was not only about resilience, but it was about innovation. And so that kind of sets, you know, to what I was talking about, that Honeywell is quickly evolving to be more of a tech company than really just a, a you know, a goods um, and industrials company, which is sometimes what it is referred to as. Um, and as you mentioned, I will let you talk about some of the new quantum notes. But the one thing is, is this company is deeply embedding itself in things like uh, high tech building management systems. That's um, right. It's developing things like UV wands that can be used on airplanes that can be scanned over trays and seat backs to quickly allow for people to get in, on and off of planes and kill uh, bacteria and virus uh, before people board planes. Um, it's building solutions that can use machine vision to have cameras flash over people inside of a building to make sure not only, uh, you know, not only fevers, we've seen that, but what about the quality of the air so that filtration can be improved in real time so that people are able to have a better experience inside buildings. This is going to matter coming back from COVID. You're going to need buildings to be safe. And of course, the whole SaaS platform built around Forge, which is a series of different applications being developed on an industry basis. And that team is doing some really interesting things at the edge. And of course, I like that their company has been realistic about needing to partner with companies like Microsoft to get from edge to cloud. And it's done that with its uh, Forge solutions being cloud com uh, compliant in a lot of ways. And then, of course, with Quantum, where it's building stimulation with, with Azure. Yeah, a lot of kudos. You know, it's nice to be in company with Microsoft and Twilio when some people don't consider you a, a tech company. And, and you know, you talked a little bit about Forge, but the irony is that uh, these folks have a, the industry leading industrial EPM uh, a system out there. And uh, surprising, unsurprisingly, they hired a bunch of um, uh, ex Oracle uh, SaaS folks to, uh, to come and help uh, build that. So, uh, kind of cool because I think we can all agree that nobody has uh, figured out uh, industrial IoT yet, uh, and there's a, a lot of ways to go. But hey, let's jump in specifically to uh, a, a big announcement that uh, that uh, Honeywell made uh, that uh, more insights and strategy analyst uh, Paul Smith Goodson uh, uh, wrote about. So. Uh, the way there's a couple ways to measure performance, but uh, there are really no benchmarks. So the industry talks qubits, which which is more like frequency uh, in in traditional compute, and then there's this notion of um, quantum volume, uh, which adds in things like uh, 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 qubit quality uh, out there. Uh, and there's only two companies, believe it or not, with uh, enough guts. Oh, did I just say that? Uh, to come out and and actually uh, publish a quantum volume number, 
Uh, and this week, uh, Honeywell introduced a quantum volume 512. And, you know, we're still at um, kind of flexing uh, uh, around a lot of research uh, and things like that. And, and nobody has really come in uh, to the point where you would say, hey, I'm going to replace my uh, traditional computer uh, with, with, with a, a quantum computer. We're, we're years away uh, from that. But this is how uh, that you uh, this is how uh, you get there. Uh, I have personally uh, seen the Honeywell uh, H1 uh, computer or a, a version of it, and it is completely uh, amazing. Uh, it's near silent, uh, more laser beams than uh, Star Wars, uh, but it's something cool, uh, Daniel, if you haven't uh, seen it yet, and I, I think you will, to, uh, uh, to check it out. It truly is uh, in, uh, uh, in, in incredible. Yeah, the, the quantum discussion is evolving quickly. You get a lot of questions. When are we going to see applications, real world applications that are going to be applied? Well, we're starting to see that now through simulation. We recently heard about a partnership with Samsung where they're using quantum to try to define ways to extend the life of batteries, which everybody is impacted by. Um, you know, first it's about what can be done, then it's how can it be done faster. But I think the biggest thing for people that are just starting to pay attention to quantum is just remember, it's going to be done in partnership with classical computing, not that's right. New off. Um, and so you'll hear more about this from us. It still is very scientific. It feels a little bit like going back to grad school when you're learning about it and talking about it. But over time, that's a lot how classical computing was. That's how traditional node uh, evol evolutions were. And now we talk about it like it's a, you know, a second language, Pat, but it wasn't always that way. Yeah. And it's kind of like the way we treat uh, GPUs uh, early on where you can't boot a GPU, right? You use it as an accelerator. And, and when you're writing an application, you have uh, specific calls to that, or you're using some kind of API uh, or some type of high-end uh, IDE that, that abstracts that, that layer. So, uh, but this is going to be the hallmark technology, uh, the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> We're going to be talking about this probably as long as uh, you and I uh, are in this business, which in a way makes it exciting. It is exciting. 